There we go. There is the mute button that comes off by itself somehow, sometimes a little late. Well, welcome in, everybody. I want to note, too, that you classes are like the best dancers of all time. There's some, like, epic enthusiasm before we got underway, so way to go, everybody. My name is Jesse. I am your virtual adventure guide here with Exploring by the Seat of Your Pants, and welcome to another broadcast. We are early on into our second week of programs diving in in an epic 2023. We've already been to the Philippines. We have been to India. We've been to California. We've been all over the world, and we've got so much more to come this week as we continue our mission of showcasing the coolest scientists, explorers, and places around this planet with you. So a big thank you to all of you. Bravo to your teachers. Just bravo to you students for coming in and being really curious with us as we get to showcase these really cool people and places around the globe. Now today, I'm particularly excited because we are diving back in with one of our very favorite topics on one of our very favorite animals here. Before the break, before the holiday season, where we all got a chance to relax and eat a lot, we did a whole bevy of programs on polar bears, and we wanted to keep that fun going as we start off in 2023 with Dr. James Raffin. He is a scientist with over 40 years of experience out in the field. He's a writer. He's an explorer. He has been lauded by organizations around the world for his work, not just seeking to understand wildlife, but to convey that magic, that understanding with audiences like you. So today in our most popular program so far in 2023, I'm going to turn it over to Dr. James Raffin in just a minute to blow your minds about polar bears, to understand why they have long noses. I don't know. We're going to find out together and then take your questions from around North America and beyond. So thank you all so much for joining us. And without further ado, Dr. Raffin, thank you so much for uh, being a part of our broadcast today. <laughs> hey, Jesse. Hi, everybody. <laughs> I'm having a little uh, little geographic uh, fun here. I'm thinking of Arizona. I was just in Kansas and almost neighbors there. I'm going to Thunder Bay next week. Hello, everybody. It's so nice to be here to talk about why polar bears have long noses and other questions. So I want to begin with an other question that maybe some of you have thought about. And that is, have you ever thought about being how you become the captain of your own ship? Now, I'm using the ship, it could be an icebreaker, it could be a snowmobile, it could be a canoe, it could be a reindeer sled or a bicycle or a minivan. The question I'm asking you, which I think has everything to do with exploration, is, is uh, have you ever thought about taking complete charge of your own life? Because I think that's what exploration helps you do. So in addition to thinking about polar bears and long noses, uh, I want to I want to come back to that question at the end to talk a little bit about the whole process of exploration that's been a huge part of my life. Because inside us all is a kind of a compass. There's the compass that points to the North Pole, but then there's also the compass that points to the sort of moral North Pole about what's right and wrong. And I think exploration can help you with, with both of those sets of directions. But by way of introduction, I just want to say I'm an accidental Canadian. Now, like some of you, you may be accidental citizens of where you live. Um, and for though, if we have a South African class with you, here's a story for you. My dad was in the Navy. He was a surgeon lieutenant in the British Navy. My mom was a midwife in Scotland. And after the Second World War, they knew they wanted to leave the United Kingdom. And my dad had Navy buddies in South Africa, in Australia, and in Canada. And that each uh, the Navy friend could provide a sort of a help, a beachhead for the family to get started there. For some reason, they ruled out Australia. My sisters and I think maybe they owed those people money. Maybe not. I don't know. But as the family story goes, my parents flipped the coin <laughs> to decide whether they would go to South Africa or to Canada. And little old me turned up as a kid in the mighty Speed River in southwestern Ontario. And uh, I've spent the rest of my life exploring this country of which I'm an accidental citizen. And uh, I've always wondered who we might have been if the family had gone to South Africa. I've met a few South Africans along the way, and I'm starting to get a sense of how that might have shaped me. But my entire life really has been spent exploring Canada and uh, actually other parts of the world as well. Some of it by canoe, some of it on foot, some of it on snowshoe. But um, maybe you too could end up being an explorer of your country or others traveling by different ways. Because not only is that a wonderful way to answer questions, to go to different parts of the uh, place where you live, it's also a wonderful way to build a living. And that living for me has resulted in uh, 
writing a bunch of books and writing for film and television. So taking the experiences that I have had in the outdoors, in the web, in the back and beyond, many of which are with polar bears and uh, and writing about them. And in fact, I have had many encounters with polar bears, not least uh, last May, I was with a young friend of mine uh, on a dog sled in uh, the Northwest Passage, and we came across uh, some polar bears there. He was actually hunting polar bears as we went. But um, uh, if you're interested in polar bears, I'm not surprised, but I'm here to tell you a little bit about polar bears because I think they're one of the most interesting animals anywhere that I've found in my travels. Now, if you're sitting in your classroom, you may not have seen a real polar bear yet, but I bet you've seen polar bears in advertising for everything under the sun, from candy bars to conservation to food to cars. Polar bears seem to catch people's eye, and marketers have, have known that really well. And in a lot of ways, it's kind of ironic because this bear that is we love so much is being affected by how we're living our lives. It's a, it's a creature of ice, and as you may have heard, you may have studied in school, the ice is disappearing. And in fact, um, my work as a scientist, as a writer, is very much informed by the fact that the appetites that we have as people for energy have actually shaped this world, not only for us, but you've probably heard of global climate change or global warming. These are things that uh, factors of our life that are affecting our lives because of the way we've lived. And in fact, they're calling the geological epoch, the time we're living in now, the Anthropocene, the time of people, uh, because we've had such a... Uh, and of course, if you are a creature of the ice, which the Inuit, the, the circumpolar Inuit are, and many other peoples in the circumpolar world. But if you're a, uh, a creature of the ice, that's a two-legged, but a, or a polar bear, um, you are in trouble. You're, you're having, there are problems that are coming up because the ice in a, in a lot of ways is disappearing. There are probably somewhere, we don't know for sure, but between 20 and 30,000 and when you uh, polar bears in the world, and there are 19 subpopulations around the circumpolar world. So look at that map. There's the, the North Pole in the middle where the lines of longitude all come together. Um, the ones that I know best, uh, although I have seen polar bears in almost all of those regions, the ones I know best, and the little book I was showing you there called um, uh, Ice Walker is set in southwestern Hudson Bay, which is down near Churchill, Manitoba. But to a greater or lesser extent, all of those polar bears, although we put them on our ice cream packages, they're really struggling because of the changing circumstances. But I want to sort of just begin talking about long noses to say, do polar bears have long noses? And in fact, they do. So from a black bear, which is the smallest kind of bear, through the three, well, the brown bears is another kind of bear. And there are actually, um, you've heard maybe of Kodiak bears or grizzly bears. Those are actually all the same species. It turns out if you, just like humans, if you grow up and you eat different foods, you have different climates, you end up as a kind of a same same two-legged human species, but in the same of the case of the brown bears, brown bears, if they grow up in a particular place, have different characteristics and brown bears, Kodiak bears, grizzly bears, but they all have longer noses than the black bear and the grizzly, the polar bear, which we think uh, descended or they moved out on the ice from the uh, from brown bears have a longer nose, and that's for sure. So uh, I will say that if you do, were to do a study of measuring, going around and meeting, a, I don't know, a thousand bears in the world of all the different kinds, you, I think you, the polar bear would win of having a long nose. How do I know that? Well, I began life, maybe you would do this too, as a marine biologist, that's me with an anesthetized bear uh, in a cage at the University of Guelph. And I was learning what that bear could see. Uh, he was a bear that had been captured in Churchill, Manitoba, because he had become, uh, well, they put that town right on his migratory route. And uh, he had actually started being not very afraid of people. And he ended up going to the Toronto Zoo. And he wasn't a very good zoo bear. So he came to the university where he 
participated with me in a study, and that's me with a, a lab tech called Jan and a, a veterinary anesthetist called uh, Wayne McDonnell, uh, who had helped me uh, uh, put the bear temporarily to sleep, and that's me getting some blood from it. But in the middle of doing that research, I realized that um, if I, I found it very difficult, it was a hard thing to do to be uh, in, a, in a cage with a, or, or in a room with a bear all the time. And I finally, after that study, I realized that really, if I wanted to know anything more about polar bears, I would go and see them in the wild. And that's what I've been doing. They really are a fascinating creature. They're huge. Um, so take, uh, what, would, what would we say, maybe uh, uh, six or eight of your classmates, maybe six, um, and you put them together, that's the mass of a polar bear. And they have this incredible life and they know how to do, they can live in total darkness, like up around Resolute Bay in uh, Nunavut now, uh, it's completely dark. The sun never rises because of the way that the earth is tilted relative to the sun. And uh, they just, uh, there are a lot of things about them that I find absolutely fascinating. And the one thing that I wanna talk about is, well, a couple of the most fascinating things. First of all, if you have ever been in a frozen place, and presumably some of you have, you know that water freezes and everybody, every mammal like us who feed their babies with milk, we need water. And polar bears are mammals, they need water too. But here's a very cool thing, it has nothing to do with the noses really, but I just wanna share with this, this with you. Polar bears get their water from what's called metabolic water. They their main dietary substance is fat from seals that they catch on the ice. But if you were to go outside and have a campfire and cook a s'more roast to marshmallow on the fire, that fire, what's that about? Well, you take wood, which is fuel, you add oxygen from the atmosphere, you add a spark, it actually burns and it produces two main things. One is carbon dioxide, and that's part of the problem of us burning fossil fuels and heating up the atmosphere, but it produces carbon dioxide and water. And we really don't really think about the water that comes off our campfires, but for a polar bear, of course, there's always energy from a fire as well that, that you know, you stand by it, it heats you up. That's energy that's caused by that reaction of fuel plus O2. Well, bears have exactly the same combustion situation going on. They eat fat, from seals, which is carbon. They add oxygen from that they breathe in from the air. And without drinking, because they're on salt water most of the time and any fresh water, which is most of the ice is frozen. You can't really get water from that. When they burn fat as a food, it produces carbon dioxide, which they breathe out. And what else? Water, metabolic water. And of course, ox or energy, bears when they burn their food and that allows them to stay warm when it's really, really cold outside. That is one of the very cool things. Other cool things about polar bears, maybe you haven't thought, they really uh, ha are so beautifully adapted to walking on ice from being a little bit pigeon-toed, which gives them meaning turning their feet in a little bit with their big claws and that allows them to get grip on the ice. But here's something to think about. In the bottom of those polar bear feet, let's say in this scene that you see with a mother and two cubs, let's say it's minus 40 Celsius, which is about minus 40 Fahrenheit as well. On the bottom of their feet, they've got pads uh, that you can see here and these, these bears at Assiniboine uh, Bear Recovery Place in Winnipeg. Between the ice, which is minus 40, and inside their body, which is plus, well, it's plus 37, it's the same as us, it's 98.6 Fahrenheit. In that distance through the skin of their foot, there is a huge temperature gradient and bears have figured out how to do that without freezing their feet. Absolutely fascinating. And how do they do that? Well, they catch uh, seals. And if you look at a newly killed seal, you'll notice unlike us where we eat the meat when we're, when we're meat eaters, all a bear will eat if it's got lots of seals is they'll just eat the fat. They'll leave the meat on the on the ice. But I want to get to the nose because that's what I promised here. Why do polar bears have long noses? Well, right now, the polar bears that are on the ice in the circumpolar world, and we're more or less in the middle of their winter, 
let's say it's minus 37 degrees centigrade outside. It's always plus 37 degrees centigrade inside. And what goes on when they breathe is they end up in that distance of their nose, nine inches or 23 centimeters. They somehow have to take that dry, cold air from outside and turn it into warm, moist air on the inside so that they can get the oxygen out of it. And where does that temperature change occur from minus 37 to plus 37? Well, boys and girls, moms and dads, men and women of the audience, that is what goes on in the nose. And clearly the longer the nose is, the better that temperature exchange can happen. And if you actually look inside a polar bear's nose, like right in the end, like us, it has sinuses or spaces inside its nose but it's full of these surfaces called nasal turbinates, which are lots of surface area with lots of blood vessels so that you can warm the air. And they can actually humidify the air as well and dehumidify the air. It's a, they're amazing creatures. But here is the most amazing thing about that long nose and all of that surface area inside the polar bear's nose. If you imagine how we see, so maybe you're smelling your lunch or maybe you, you, you well, think about just smelling a beautiful flower. If, if, if that is a capability, the human capability of seeing, smelling, sorry, our dog, the fa basic family dog would smell probably a hundred times better than we do. In other words, they, the scent that they can smell can be a hundred times fainter or less intense than the, the smell that we can smell. A bloodhound, which is a particular a dog that smells particularly well, they use those for tracking. Police people use those and military people use those for tracking. A bloodhound probably can smell 300 times better than we can with that rose. Well, get this, a polar bear can smell four to seven times better than a bloodhound, meaning they can probably smell some of them 2,000 times better than we can. And that long nose has a lot to do with giving it the best sniffer in the animal world. I want to finish and open up to your questions by coming back to the idea of being captain of your own ship. Because whatever it is you're asking questions about, in the early part of my career, I asked questions about marine mammals. And I wanted to work with those. I'd read stuff. I'd seen stuff. I, was, I wanted to ask. And But answering those questions, if you're an explorer, and this is something that you can start right now. You may have already started this. Answering questions with an explorer's frame of mind, in literature it's called the heroic quest, but it, it involves preparing yourself, which is learning as much as you can, getting the right clothes, picking your friends who are your traveler, you're going to... Eventually, you learn and you decide that I'm going to go and answer those questions. You need to separate yourself from what you know, from your family. And of course, when you're out there, whether it's climbing a mountain, going down a river, going to ice, going to, into a polar bear den with a mother polar bear, whatever it happens to be, you end up getting into trouble when you're away. And that's why you want to prepare really well. But out of that trouble, that you might find will be, I hope, the answer to your question, which then allows you to come back somehow stronger, wiser from your travels, from, from your explorations that allow you to take that into the next uh, adventure that you might have or the next exploration that you might have. And I just wanna finish by saying one of my favorite pieces of literature, and maybe you can get your teachers to read you this. It's a poem called Ulysses, which is actually based on a Greek story of an old, old sailor who's being sort of interviewed by a younger sailor. And the younger sailor saying, well, what, you know, what have you learned in your lifetime of exploration? And the old guy, Ulysses, looks at him and says, I am a part of all that I have met and all the experiences, yet all experience is an arch, where through gleams that untraveled world whose margin fades forever and forever when I move. By buying into a life of exploration and answering questions by getting out there, you actually are looking at a horizon always of newness and new things. But if you ask whose arch is it that you're looking through and whose margin is it, that's where it gets really interesting. So just to finish, I want you to imagine yourself at the helm of your own ship, whatever kind of ship it will be. Here are the kinds of things that you need to create your arch and that you learn from experience. 
But I want to just say that, you know, when you're trying to decide what to do when it comes to making a decision about how to spend Saturday or what to do in the evening, sometimes there are people who come along and they kind of drop a compass or a, a magnet over you and they kind of steer you in a direction you may or may not want to go in just because of their the, the way they do it. And sometimes that's not the exact direction you want to go. And what I'm saying is if you get out there and you start asking questions that might take you to a family member, it might take you to a library, it might take you to the North Pole. These are it's a process that goes on. Eventually you will build an arch that will shape how you view the world that it's part of it. your family's part of it, the skills that you develop, your outlook, your friends, the morals that you have, these create uh, exploration helps you create and become who you want to be because of the kinds of things you run into, the challenges that you come into out in the world. And for me, it was polar bears early on. It's still polar bears in a way. But um, if you want to think about becoming the captain of your own ship and maybe you joining the work of people doing polar bear research, I'm saying that can start right now and that you can start truing your compass, your moral compass and your geographic compass to the places you want to go and start thinking about that right now. And Jesse, that's where I'm going to stop because I know there will be questions that will add, I probably won't have the answers to, but I'm ready, ready to give it a try. James, that was a spectacular presentation, and, and you were correct. Before we started the presentation, James said it would be a unique session for me, and it and truly was. I love that you had Outlook as a keystone in the arch, and I love that you focus so much on, on just that idea in general and moral compass as being a part of the, the benefits of exploration, the importance of that. Uh, I think it's a really a, a unique message for kids. A lot of people don't emphasize that, and I'm really, really glad you did. If you want to come out of screen share so you can see us again a little better, have a better conversation, by all means, play around with that for a sec. I'm going to head to YouTube for a first question before we get underway. And then Miss Brown's class in Winnipeg, I'm coming to you next. But Miss Tomasha's class joining us in Alaska today. So our, a class that may have even seen some of the bears that we're talking about today. Uh, they want to know a bunch of questions, but let's pick one in particular. Uh, how long can they hold their breath? So if they were to go underwater, is there a amount of time they can hold their breath? Do you know by chance? Uh, the answer is that uh, is a long time, far far longer than we can. By the way, uh, I love those pictures of bears from underneath were taken in your fair city in Assiniboine Park. And if you haven't been to Assiniboine Park, uh, the work that they're doing there with orphan polar bears is absolutely fantastic. And every time I go to Winnipeg, uh, I go there because I think the work that they're doing is really important. But I have in my in my own experience seen bears disappear under the water for more than five minutes, which when you think about it, if you, that's like you could swim two lengths of the pool at the Y underwater. I have read that it can go on much longer than that, even as much as eight or nine minutes, which is incredible when you think about it. And actually the lab where I was doing that um, that uh, vision research yeah. uh, we were all also working with seals and we knew a lot more about how seals could dive because seals are like us in a lot of ways and they have what they call a diving reflex which is really cool so when a polar bear goes in the water it's like a seal the diving reflex is actually where the the vessels in your periphery get shut down by your autonomic nervous system and it actually puts all of the warm air, it actually takes down the demand for oxygen so that you can send the oxygen to the important parts of your body so that you can conserve. And uh, I don't know if you've read or heard about um, uh, free divers, human free divers. These are people who go into the water. They can train themselves to be under for long, long periods of time, so can polar bears. Good question. I mean, it's a great question. I was going to say for our students that might have seen Avatar over the holidays, Kate Winslet uh, did a seven-minute breath hold being trained by freedivers. So she's just an actress. You can learn those skills very, very, uh, not easily, but it, it's something that anyone can pick up if you dedicate your time to it. Quick note for all our teachers on StreamYard, I am coming to all of you. You don't need to type questions in the chat. I'm going to be there in a sec. That's why we're all here together. Miss Brown's class heading to Winnipeg. Uh, speaking of our, our zoo friends, come on in, guys. Hey. <laughs> Hello. Hello. Hi. Hi. Okay. Everyone can see and hear us, guys. Yes. Nice to have you here. Do you have a question for James? Uh, 
voice? Can you say that again, Jesse? I just said you have a question for James. What's up, boys? Well, they have so many questions. If we just have one, we voted on it. Yep. Okay. Uh, the question that we picked was we wanted to know what was his craziest slash most interesting experience with the personal encounter, like a, just a short story, but what was kind of the wildest thing that you uh, experienced being face to face with a polar bear or in proximity? Yeah, great question. <laughs> no pressure. <laughs> I get a little creeped out just thinking about this, but I'll give you the bare bones. Um, I was asked by the government of the Northwest Territories to go and investigate Wager Bay, which is they wanted to turn it into a park for Nunavut, what would be Nunavut. And I was in a kayak and I was actually with four other people, but they were in two other double kayaks and they had kites on their kayaks. So they were way far away. I was by myself in a single kayak paddling along. And that happens to be the second most concentrated place of polar bears in the summer anywhere on the planet. There are uh, something like 81 bears per thousand kilometers of shoreline because they go off the ice in there. So anyway, I'm paddling along and I see this bear suddenly walking along. I may be just a couple hundred meters off the shore. And uh, I thought, oh, uh, I'm by myself and the bears on the shore. Uh, my friends are way out of voice reach. And uh, I thought, oh, um, what would happen if that bear decided to come and investigate me. And sure enough, it, dro it dropped in the water. And having been a bear researcher, I knew that they'd been sighted 50 kilometers from land and that they could swim up to 12 kilometers an hour. And I knew that when I went as hard as I could go, that was not as fast as a bear. So the bear starts swimming out and I my life passed before my eyes. I thought, well, this is it. This is it. I'm going to get eaten by a polar bear. It's going to eat my kayak. It's going to eat me. And this is going to be it. I thought, well, the least I can do is take a picture of it. So I took a picture of it and then I paddled like crazy, but it still, it was getting closer and closer. And I thought, oh, I get, I guess this is it. And all of a sudden the bear just kind of turned and went back to shore. And I thought, oh, but then I looked at the shore and I realized that it was foraging. It was just wandering along the shore. It came to a cliff on the shore that, and instead of going up and around this little cliff on the shore, it's a marine mammal. It just dropped in the water. It may not eat, well, it wouldn't have known I was there, but it had no particular interest in a stinky old kayaker. And, but it's a good example of how we think we're the center of our own universe, our own world. And it turned out that this bear was just doing what it was doing. But I still have dream, <laughs> dreams about that moment of the bear, like trying to, uh, yeah, anyway. But thank you for giving me PTSD. Yeah, yeah, thanks, guys. Um, that's a great story. I like that you took a picture of it. It's amazing. Quite often, uh, we have explorers and wildlife photographers here all the time, and, and we get the diciest story question a lot, and that the instinct is like, oh, well, might as well, I, I've half fallen off the cliff. Well, we'll take a picture, and at least there's something for posterity. It's wild that they can out swim a person in a kayak. That, I would never have guessed that. that well, is I can also tell you, Jer Jesse, that it, <laughs> it's a terrible picture. <laughs> so not, not really. That's why it didn't feature in the presentation. Yeah. That's why you have to pay attention to what you see. I mean, and some at sometimes I'm convinced, having led groups of people, sometimes I think a camera is a very particular form of blindness. Yeah. Because if you're there and you're saying, I gotta get the picture, I gotta get the picture, I gotta get the picture, yeah. you walk away from that event. You might have the picture, but you in the end you have no idea what the bear looks like, smells like. You don't really know much about its behavior because you've been so busy capturing the picture, you really haven't paid attention. Yeah. And uh, I do recommend to people who travel with me, including me, to put the camera away as much as possible so that you can attend to what's going on. Understand and be present in the situation and by all means capture it in some fashion. But we've all seen people on trips that are constantly glued to their face and they're taking pictures for you know the whole time and you, you get more out of life if you are attuned to those other experiences so I'm, I'm glad we got that message in too miss hatcher's class i'm heading to toronto to you guys and then we're coming to our arizona uh agglomeration of all the classes but come on in and, and good old do hey guys um what i've got what i've got i've got adaptations 
adaptations does the polar bear have other than the nose? Nice. That's a really good question. So a long, long time ago, maybe 250,000 years, which is even older than your mom and dad, um, polar bears were brown bears. So what a adaptation. So for some reason, uh, brown bears headed out on the ice. So they're brown, they're dark. It turned out that bears that were lighter colored did better. They, they had more luck hunting on the ice than brown bears. And so that's an adaptation where the lighter, 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 and now you get a polar bear that's actually almost white. They're never white, but they, I mean, they look white and they, but they're light colored and they do that. Um, Another adaptation that's really interesting is that like a beaver or an alligator, they actually have a third eyelid called a tapetum that crosses over so that they can see underwater better. Um, that's a pretty cool adaptation. Uh, another adaptation is that um, when they eat seals, they actually, uh, they actually bite their head. They don't bite any other part of them. And, and they actually have... Uh, they have been, so, or what uh, a trait that has been selected, which is an adaptation through uh, genetic recombination through multiple generations, is that they have canine teeth, those big teeth, the chomper teeth at the front, but the gap between those teeth and the grinder teeth further behind is a bit bigger on a polar bear than it is on a, on a brown bear. And it's thought uh, that that gives them more killing power with their with their front teeth. I talked about the um, the incredible sense of smell, uh, which is an adaptation that allows them not only to find their prey in the dark, it also has brought around. And if you if you read Ice Walker, I hope you will. Uh, there's a whole story there about the bear mating and how those the bottoms of their feet they have in those feet. Uh, little glands called papillae, which actually put uh, a kind of a, uh, a sign a chemical signature of the readiness of the bear to participate in mating. And just in just in the process of walking along, a female bear will leave a trail that is like a whole billboard about who they are, how many children, how many cubs they've had, whether or not they're ready to have cubs. That's another adaptation that's that's absolutely fascinating. The fact that they can uh, see in 24 hour darkness or in 24 hour light, it's thought that the tapetum, the uh, the third eyelid might actually be like a Foster Grant wrap around sunglass as well. Um, that just put it this way. Uh, Every creature, I don't care if you're algae, bacteria, COVID-19, or a human being, we're all adapted to our uh, environments and polar bears particularly to this, what people, some people have called the most hostile environment on earth, you know, the, the Arctic, the cold, uh, well, it's super cold in the winter and dark and super warm and light in the summer. They're, they're an extraordinary creature. They really are. And I'm so glad you mentioned warm in the summer. So many people don't think about that when it comes to the Arctic. And it's always a pleasure to get to highlight uh, the changed landscape or the radically changed landscape that happens up there when you, you have sort of summer, late spring. Uh, and I'm glad we got that in for our classes. Guys, this is a great Q&A so far. Thank you so much for the excitement. I'm going to head to our Arizona trio of classes, uh, and then we'll we'll do it. I put the order for everyone in the chat, and so we're going to come to you guys in Sierra Vista, which sounds like a really happy place to be. Welcome in. Oh, I knew you were excited in Arizona. <laughs> Here's our question. Here's your question. <laughs> um, what's a polar bear diet beside a seal? Yeah, perfect. A diet beside the seal, James. Oh, besides the seal? Yeah. Um, they will eat walrus if they can. Walrus are a tougher animal to get to kill, but they will eat that. They will eat two kind, kinds of seals. There's a bearded seal, which is bigger, and that's like getting a bit like a triple Big Mac instead of just a single. Um, there's more fat on that. But what I was going to say about the warm summer thing, the diet of seal, they need to eat fat. 
so they're so beautifully adapted to the Arctic, people will say, well, if the ice is disappearing and they can't eat any seals, why don't they just eat bird eggs or plants or something else? They actually need the calories. They need the calories from fat. So if, if all you eat is butter and somebody said, well, we don't have any butter anymore. All we have is this, uh, these alfalfa sprouts and premium crackers, you know, like soda crackers. You cannot live on that because you can't get enough calories. So bears need calories, and they've adapted to that over this long, long period of their evolution. Interestingly, though, when they go ashore in places like southwestern Hudson Bay, where there is no ice in the winter, they go ashore. They, that, their existence there is called walking hibernation. And in fact, most bears do not eat anything the entire time they're on the shore. They forage around and they might eat a bit of kelp or if they find a, a, a colony of uh, snow geese or something, they might raid that and eat a few eggs, but they can't get any fat, so they don't eat. And in fact, um, that is an absolutely amazing aspect of a polar bear that maybe a lot of people don't know is that when they're on shore waiting for the ice to form again, um, they're really trying to spend as little energy as possible. So when you see a lot of these pictures of polar bears that are taken in places like Churchill, Manitoba, where they, it's actually a tourist thing, one of the reasons why people and polar bears can coexist there is that the bears have really no interest in being ferocious or anything because they're trying to save energy because they're actually losing weight every day. They're living off their fat. So here's the conundrum if you're a bear. Uh, and uh, there's a whole lot to say about this. But in order to do that walking hibernation lifestyle, you need to come ashore with enough fat on your body to use that so that it'll, it'll do you for the summer. So if you've got a nice long winter where you can eat lots of seals and you can bulk up and you can get quite fat for that, that'll do you for a long hibernation. But what's climate change doing? It's shortening the winter. It's making the amount of ice shorter, ergo the amount of seal you get to eat. So you're, you probably go ashore in 2023 lighter or with less body fat than uh, you did in 2003. And secondly, not only is the winter getting shorter to bulk up, the summer's getting longer and there's a longer time. And this is one of the reasons why polar bear populations are in trouble because if a female polar bear is starving and in like stre food stress, yeah. she won't, uh have any babies because th her body knows it isn't ready and uh, this is maybe deeper into the physiology of bears than you can but it really does come down to a pretty interesting uh situation where uh, um food uh, is so specialized that in order to survive if that specialty is somehow compromised by climate change uh, the whole species is compromised. Yeah, I'm really glad we, we get this in. And then, of course, this is something that we get in all our polar bear presentations because it's so important. They're sort of this canary in the coal mine. They're a bellwether for climate change that a lot of people recognize as such. They're sort of the iconic species for how our impact on the planet is impacting a particular species. And one that, as you showed in your advertising slide, uh, is one that we really affiliate with. We love, people love polar bears. And so they've become this, this icon for the importance of doing, taking action to help prevent this as much as possible and to continue trying to understand polar bears and all their populations that we have as good an understanding as possible about how our, our impacts are, are changing their lives around the globe. So I'm really glad we dove in with that, James. Um, time flies and you're having fun. I know one of our classes already had to go. So what we're going to do is we're going to dive in with our last three classes live. I'm going to try and take one or two YouTube ones if I can. Uh, if you have to go, that's fine. But we might go a little bit longer because we're rebels together uh, here about polar bears. So Miss Raider's class, come on in and uh, take us away. Hey, guys. Hi. Uh, how far can a polar bear's nose nose smell? Yeah, good question. That is a really, really good question. And the answer is uh, for dozens of kilometers, wow. sometimes hundreds. So uh, polar bears, when they're mating, it has been shown that they can pick up, because their noses are so sensitive, um, they can actually pick up. If you imagine uh, 
putting something smelly uh, like a, uh, I don't know, like a bottle of perfume, which is really aromatic on and imagine just threads of that smell traveling around. We need a really thick smell. We, we got to stick, we have to stick our nose right in the bottle, but imagine just a little thread of those molecules. Bears can pick those up dozens of kilometers away. And some people have argued, maybe even as I said, hundreds of kilometers away. Um, and we know that the air that they're breathing has chemicals in it from far, far away. And uh, people are actually making these old factory maps, like almost like topographic maps that actually show how polar bears can, can smell. Um, but it is an adaptation that has allowed them to do some amazing things. You know, uh, when you come to near something stinky, whether it's a garbage can, we look right at it and we smell and we say, oh yeah, okay, that's the garbage can. Well, one of the very, another very cool thing about polar bears, and I'm the reason why I'm thinking of a great question, is that when a polar bear is walking along and they pick up one of these little threads of molecules that might be another bear or it might be garbage in the dump in, in Churchill, you know, 70 kilometers away, not only can they tell that the smell is such and such, if they've learned it before, they can also know that if they turn that way, they'll get closer to the smell. And if they turn that way, they'll get farther away from it. They, they can actually tell about the gradients of smells. Can you tell I'm pretty excited about polar bears? <laughs> I was just going to say, uh, every student should find something in their life that they are as passionate as you are about polar bears and you're set. Uh, you can captain your own ship, whatever that may be. Maybe it is polar bears. Maybe it's something entirely different, but try and be as passionate uh, as James is. This is great. Um, we're going to head to Mr. McGill's class. I'm going to Madam Stephanie after that. Uh, thanks for sticking around, guys. So many, so much interest. I love your guys' enthusiasm in this class. Hey, Hi. 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 What can we do to help save the polar bear's habitat? My favorite question. <laughs> There are a lot of things you can do, and that starts at your own kitchen table. You can make good choices about the amount of energy you're using in your family, uh, because that will take down your contribution to uh, global warming. Um, there are things you can do to live conscientiously, like stop drinking bottled beverages, uh, use recon re recyclable containers. So that, that for me, is a full-time job, trying to live uh, consciously and um, low on the on the uh, carbon production side of things. Um, you can affiliate with um, some of the conservation organizations that are doing good work with polar bears, and I'd be happy to correspond with you about that. And I'm sure uh, Jesse has has ideas about that. Polar Bear International. There are, there are a number of different things you can do there. And the other thing, and the reason why I've worn my, my vest today, is that there are organizations that get youth involved with uh, conservation writ large. Students on Ice, which is a Canadian organization that takes kids from around the world to the polar regions to help them understand. Um, and in it, Students on Ice, for example, is getting some of the students who've been part of their programs. I've been a staffer uh, with them since 2000 when they were found, but they actually have a delegation of six youth who are going to be at the table for the Antarctic Treaty negotiations next year. So there are organizations that will take you into um, uh, that will help you with your exploring that I encourage you to explore, to try to do that. And it'll, it'll need, you'll have to get your parents involved. Maybe your teachers involved. You're going to have to take some risks to do that, but those are available to you. And let me tell you this, one of the things that I researched a long time ago, but it was, it had to do with environmentally responsible behavior. I was looking at people, some, you know, some people pick up candy wrappers and other people like chain themselves to bulldozers because they don't want those bulldozers to make the swamp go away. What is the, the, the best predictor of that kind of behavior, environmentally responsible behavior? It's not school, although there are some amazing teachers out there. You know what it is? It's time spent in pristine environments, meaning wild environments, unsullied environments. And the more time you can figure out or figure out how to do that, you may have been with your family to uh, national parks, provincial parks, that's fantastic. The more time you spend there, because what happens there 
is you don't have a goof like me telling you why it's important. There's no intermediary between you and nature. And the more you can do that, the better it is. And that too is good for the polar bears. James, that was a beautiful answer. I want to stress for our classes, polarbearsinternational.org. We've got a program with them in February. They're a spectacular partner of ours. We've done many, many broadcasts with them over the years. SOI Foundation is Students on Ice, the incredible work that they do. Again, we've actually done major broadcast series with the Students on Ice team over the last few years, so couldn't have picked two better organizations than that. And James, you might even be interested to know, for our students, I know we've got some new teachers this year in backyardbio.net. Backyard Bio is our big initiative in May to get kids out in those natural spaces. Go explore close to home as far as possible. Find the local wildlife that lives near you and you will be inspired to take action because if you understand how wonderful the natural world is, you pretty much guaranteed will want to protect it. So I'm really glad we got all those messages in. James, we've got uh, our one last question from our live classes before we wrap up and say farewell with everyone. Madam Stephanie's class, if you guys want to come on in, you are good to go. Hey. Hi, and thanks so uh, thanks so much for, for this presentation. I was just wondering, since, you know, po since ice caps are melting and all that global warming stuff, I was just wondering, I know it's maybe unethical, but, uh, but I'm like just wondering, if like for example we take certain polar bears because I've been because 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 I've been to the zoo yep. and like we put them in like not like not like not like in the cages because I'm because I noticed in some areas it's specifically meant to be cold. Yeah. So what like is there a like can't we just put them there or like what's the issues with doing it? Yeah, can we take all the polar bears and put them somewhere else where they're not so reliant on the ice? This is a question we get a lot actually, so I'm really glad you asked that, man. <laughs> Young man, you're a very poised person, and I really enjoyed uh, just your little question that you asked. And it is, it's a valid question, but we are who we are. We need a habitat. And for a polar bear to be a polar bear, they need to be in the wild. And that is where, yes, we can put them in, in uh, captivity, um, but at some point they stop being polar bears in the sense that they don't have all of the responses and all of the, they don't use those beautiful adaptations. We can move their genes into the next round, but but what would be the children or the offspring of bears in captivity because they don't know how to hunt, they're being fed and so on and so on and so on. Um, it's a, it's a, a really interesting question, but as soon as people get involved in the conservation of a species um, at that level, uh, I think it becomes problematic because the humans are doing the thinking when we should be using the beauty of the natural uh, thinking and adaptations of the animal. Um, if there's something that we could do at, in, that is going to help the species more, it probably has to do with setting aside habitat so that organisms like the polar bear can thrive. And there are some very exciting initiatives. I mean, for a long time, parks were sort of islands around the country. Well, people are thinking, well, you know, species don't live in, on islands. They, and so we've actually started linking parks so that people on migratory corridors and that sort of thing. But in order for a species like a polar bear or a parrot or a and uh, doesn't matter what it is, uh, a microorganism to be what they are, they need to be interacting with their natural environment. And those natural environments are so incredibly complex, so rich and diverse that they are impossible, even for the most well-intentioned human being, the most insightful zookeeper could never recreate the ice of the circumpolar world among other types of things. We get this question a lot, and I always like highlighting the fact that there's something you mentioned in the middle of your answer there, which is like, if you leave space for animals to thrive, you just give them that room, they tend to come back in great numbers. And this is true whether it's a tropical rainforest, Arctic habitats, coasts on oceans. I mean, we've had conservationists featuring, featured on this program from all over the globe. And that solution of let's leave it alone, let's let it grow, tends to benefit everybody. It tends to benefit the wildlife, local people, you get ecotourism, you have... Uh, animals increase all around that area because of the sort of protected zone. And so it's a complicated scenario where ice is literally melting and we need to do all these major actions to sort of mitigate that and change that. But leaving that habitat is, is so, so central. And James, I, I 
really appreciate, again, 40 years of experience in coming to that answer. And as you noted, the poise of that question, way to go to Miss uh, Madam Stephanie's student uh, for that. Now, we are at the 50 minute mark. I know our classes do need to go in a minute. Again, I will encourage you all to check out James's website to learn more. You can check out more of our polar bear programs at our YouTube channel coming up and in the past. Um, but is there any final message you wanna share with our classes before we let them go, James? Well, um, yeah, there's a thing called the Explorers Club and uh, we're in New York. It's uh, people from all over the world and we're looking for younger members. And if you would like to find out more about that, you can Google it. But if you need a sponsor, uh, contact me directly and tell us, tell me what you're doing for exploration. I'd like to nominate you for to be a student member of that. But the other thing I want to finish with is that my exploring started by asking questions, looking out my bedroom window at a river a long time ago. And I'm still doing that and still enjoying that. And you can start, exploration is not something that all guys like me do. Exploration is something that humans do and you can start right now by asking questions and then getting the people you need on side, your teacher, your friends, your mom and dad, your uncles, aunts, whatever it might be, and if you need money, go raise money, figure out how to do it. Uh, if you wanna get involved in other organizations, do it. We need your energy, we need your wisdom, we need your um, uh, enthusiasm for these questions because this is a time when we need to have all of the creative capability that humans can muster. And that includes you. Sure does. I love the Explorers Club plug. We love partnering with them. I want to share some of our comments on YouTube. We've got people in Cold Lake that were excited to join you today. We've oh, got those. Hi. <laughs> who drank your ice walker and loved it. We've got people who've been on the Students on Ice journey back in 2018 and how important it was. So everything you did today and talked about. Oh, yeah, so there you go. Hi. Really is so well. Um, James, we do to end every broadcast. I'm going to bring in our teachers that didn't have to run away for lunch to say a big thank you and farewell. So Ms. Brown's class, Ms. Writer's class, Mr. McGill, thank you all so much for being here today, for your energy. Have a wonderful day, everyone, and bye for now, guys.